my name's Maddie and this is Jamie and we are here with Tish and Snooki from Manic Panic. We are going to interview them today about their experience being women um, really driving business innovation for Girl CEO Connection. So Tish and Snooki, can you guys begin by giving us a little bit of background about yourselves and the beginning of Manic Panic? Sure. Why not? <laughs> We're sisters and uh, we started Manic Panic in 1977, first punk store in America. So even though we had no business experience and we just decided to open a store as a sideline to our singing career, selling everything we loved that was like punk rock from <laughs> cosmetics and hair color to accessories and clothing, whatever we loved. We'd never sell anything we didn't love and we're still like that to this yeah. day. So throughout the years, your company combined like retail beauty products and theatrical and extreme cosmetics. How has that affected your business and marketing plan? Well, I think since... We are singers, and we're singers back then. We were in the original Blondie band and did backups of some, so many people's records. And we're on stage all the time. We had this flair for not only unusual hair, but stage cosmetics and extreme cosmetics. We wanted to bring them to the rest of the world. And from our little boutique, we used to sell tons of cosmetics. A lot of people in the East Village were in bands or on stage in some capacity, some were poets, some were painters, painters in theater, and you know, people getting into movies. So everybody had a real theatrical edge to them. We had a line around the block around Halloween because there, there was no other place in the downtown area where you could um, pick up any type of theatrical or extreme cosmetic mm -hmm. and hair color. So you guys were really going into that emerging, emerging market right at the right time, would you say? It wasn't even emerging. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't even a market. <laughs> we just loved it. selling what we love, and it was basically for ourselves and people like us on the downtown scene, and kind of started the market, and people started coming. We specialized in a certain look. We still do. People yeah. loved it then, and they love it even more now. There's more people loving it, and it's just amazing. So a lot of our viewers with Girl CEO Connection are young girls who are in school. Um, while you guys were pursuing your higher education, how did you balance your courses um, performing and managing your retail store? Nikki was better at it than I <laughs> I decided that uh, the, uh, the school I was going to, I was going to a school for fashion design, and when I realized how much it was interfering with my nightlife, I had to give something up, so I gave my fashion design school, and I figured I had learned enough. I could. But you kids stay in school! <laughs> I was uh, going to NYU at the time when we were performing on the scene downtown. We hadn't opened our store yet, so I was just juggling performing and going out at night with college, and I managed to do it, not all the time very well. <laughs> she was knitting a rug for her craft class in the bathroom of CBGB. Yeah, I had the craft course that I was taking at NYU to finish my degree. I decided everybody else in the class was like weaving little potholders and stuff, and I thought, I'm going to weave a rug. <laughs> so I made myself a loom. It was taking forever, so I dragged that loom everywhere, all over the place, every gate. We did between sets, like be in the dressing room or in the bathroom with CBGB, weaving my rug. And <laughs> I'd be doing it. If she was busy, I would be sitting there doing it. And other people would want to take a turn. Oh, let me try that. <laughs> so it was like a team effort. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think we're going to put that little rug on display at some point. Woven between blondie sets and CBGB. Um, Tish, you said you were designing clothes in fashion school, and then yeah. you decided to sell them in your store. Correct, yeah. What led you to this decision to like sell your own designs? People always loved the way we looked and made a lot of our stage wear. We just figured there was a market for it, and uh, we used to have these rock and roll rummage sales that our friend Gina lost on 2nd Avenue, like right around the corner where our store was in. We decided with her that we would open the first punk boutique in America, mm -hmm. and it was a chance for me to put out some of my design, be out there a little bit. We, we had no idea what we were doing. I mean, it's yeah. true. We really didn't. Snooki had the uh, retail experience because she had a temporary job at a department store that was going out of business, so she knew how to do the register, which we didn't have. We 
had a Louis Sherry candy box that we used for our money. I still have it. Well, yeah. I'll go get it. Um, but uh, that was her retail experience. And then when the store closed, we went dumpster diving and brought out all the mannequins and things they were throwing out. <laughs> Everything was very home. Fun. Everything was um, done on the cheap because we didn't have any money. We started with a few hundred dollars each. Basically, a dream, you know. Let's open a store. Okay. Tagline to our singing career. Yeah. yeah. And it ended up taking over our lives. This leads perfectly right into our next question. So, when you began your retail store, what was your initial vision for it? Punk rock. Punk rock. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. The first yeah. punk store in America. So we sold just everything we loved that was punk rock, records even, and just everything to do with punk lifestyle. When did you guys realize that alternative hair colors were and cosmetics were going to be your primary business? Basically, right away, because um, they seemed to be the things that were selling. And, and we knew them the best because we used them. We had such problems with the competitors on the block. They would send their employees and to see what new stuff we had brought back from England. And we'd always go over to England and find cool stuff. Then the competitors would send their spies in, see what we had, and then they'd go over to our vendors and say, well, don't sell to them anymore, sell to us. We can buy much more than they can, which they could, because they had money. We kind of got, and they were also men, so they were yeah. more pushy, you know. Yeah. And they got more respect. They did. We were young yeah, women, we were, and we didn't get no respect. We looked like kooks. And um, we weren't taken seriously in the business community. And so we were kicked to the curb by all these vendors, even though we introduced their products to America. But the one thing that our male competitors couldn't take away from us was the beauty products. They didn't know them like we did. I mean, we were bringing in Doc Martens before anyone heard of them here. We were bringing in Mary Kwan and uh, Vivian Westwood, a bunch of other British designers. Yeah. Plus doing our own, selling unused vintage. So we had like a really good variety of stuff. They didn't know how to wear it. They didn't know how to sell it. Okay. So they couldn't compete with us in beauty. Going off that, with you starting to, you know, learn how to manage finances and business operations and product development, did you have like a mentor that was helping you kind of navigate the business or did you guys just do it yourselves and kind of figure it out from there? It was DIY. I <laughs> really <laughs> Yeah, really. <laughs> we could have used at least one. Right. Because we really just had to figure out everything ourselves, and there was no internet in those days. So we, we really just had to learn by doing, and, you know, I hadn't taken any business courses right. at MU. It's pretty logical, really not rocket science. So we right. either you're yeah. making money or you're not. Right, <laughs> exactly. Um, many businesses, when first beginning, have a very formal business plan, and you guys have mentioned that you've had that DIY kind of nature. Um, did you decide to have a formal business plan at the beginning at all, or did you just learn by going? We didn't know what that meant, no. <laughs> we had no idea. Formal business plan? In, we didn't even have an informal business plan. <laughs> there was no plan at all. No, plan. <laughs> no, no, we didn't. We just thought we're opening a store, and you know, make things, you buy things, you put them in, you sell them, collect sales tax, you have to send it in. What was your greatest challenge with that then, you know, starting out your store and trying to learn everything? What would you say was the hardest part? There were so many hard parts, you know, there was a, we were in a bad neighborhood at the time, you know, the East mm -hmm. Village was not fabulous, East Village it is today, it was kind of desolate, a little dangerous, and we had a lot of shoplifters, we had people coming in, you know, go in our dressing room and do drugs. I mean, it wasn't glamorous, exactly. The competitors in the neighborhood and throughout New York, you know, basically trying to take our business away from us. And it, once they saw all the TV stations and newspapers and magazines all covering our store, first of its kind, then they wanted to get in on the action. These copycat stores started opening around us with, you know, a lot more financial backing. It was always a challenge. So many challenges. So yeah. then, well, being young, being women, we right. grew up with poor and, you know, we just had to figure out how to make do with what we had instead of what we had. Right, right. I mean, we had nothing. We had no money for fixtures or anything. We painted the floor black. A can of paint painted the floor black. Uh, somebody was going out of business selling some old display cases. We bought those for, I don't know, 5 or $10 each. Wow. 
painted them up, and I think we found one on the street. Yeah, uh, and got and somebody else sold us some clothing rack. We just put up chains and doweling. We didn't have shoe racks, so we had my boyfriend drill holes in the wall, and we stuck the stiletto heels into the hole. <laughs> <laughs> what would you say is the biggest piece that attributed to your success? Because from starting from a very DIY business, you've grown to be a massive influencer. Um, so just what, what would you say if you could choose one thing that led to your success? Perseverance. Never giving up. Right. Just, you know, any obstacle is only an obstacle. Everybody's, you know, played games where there are obstacles and you have to get around them. And, yeah, you just have to figure it out. Figure it out. Oh, hey, town sideways. Any way you can get what you need and get what you want. And also we had our mother's constant encouragement. We inherited her sheer determination. And she was always good at making something out of nothing. And she taught us that. I always remember her standing up on the kitchen sink or the kitchen cabinet, putting up a curtain with a piece of string and two nails. And she looked around at me and said, don't ever be poor. <laughs> <laughs> and I always... I always remember that, and I thought, well, you know what, poor is so bad because, you know, you have a string, and you have two nails, and you have a curtain, and it's, you know, covering the window. It's not so bad. Mm -hmm. I think that kind of stuck with us. Even if things are bad, you know, you can make it better. Just do it. I think so many people just think that they can't do it with whatever they've got. I mean, we've seen people with huge budgets, you know, do something that's rotten. And somebody with a cell phone doing something amazing, you know, mm -hmm. somebody else will have to, you know, rent uh, all this equipment. Better things can produce better things, but you, you can't give up just because you don't have what you think you need. We always have what we need most of the time. Because if you don't have a curtain on, it doesn't mm -hmm. mean you can't have a curtain. That's right. You mentioned earlier that when you opened your business, you had some massive publicity with the newspapers. Was it hard to manage, like, the publicity you were getting with, like, the new business? And did orders increase? Yeah, I mean, one, um, we were very frugal and never really overextended ourselves. Like, you know, oh, we've got some money now. Let's renovate, you know, right. make it all, put in new lighting. We knew that we needed more merchandise instead. Mm -hmm. So, we, you know, just focus on uh, the practical side, I think. The people make is that they, they think uh, they have to go all fabulous right away and expensive, and it's not always the case. I mean, that works with some people with big backing, I guess, but for us, it wasn't, it, we never thought of putting ourselves out on a limb like that. In other ways, we put ourselves out on a limb. Open the first pump boutique in America. That's kind of putting yourself out on a limb. So, um, I just wanted to ask you guys, <laughs> and that's very, very um, on par with what I was going to ask. How does it feel for you guys to have really been the originators and the influencers of an entire movement? Well, I think we're, you know, we're part of it. I, I don't know if we can attribute all of it to us. <laughs> <laughs> We'd love to take all the credit. Madison Square Garden during a halftime uh, show at the New York Knicks ba basketball game. How did it feel being honored in front of thousands of people? Oh my <laughs> god. <laughs> sisters and and running a successful business like having both things happening at the same time had to have been stressful and there had to have been challenges with that oh, yeah there have been many challenges you know we have really to, hard we have to travel really? a lot yeah we, we really travel a lot for um, business trade shows and all sorts of things two boys came on the road with us you know bring them to trade shows they'd be sitting on the ground like you know playing in the <laughs> giant halls and everything I mean it's just crazy and they grew up on airline socks you know I never had time to shop for them they were probably the worst dressed kids in our neighborhood <laughs> but the best travel 
the right and travel. Yeah. They, they, they both love to travel now because they had that opportunity when they were young, I think. But they're great kids, so, well, they're, they're adults, but <laughs> <laughs> they're, to me, they're amazing. So I think whatever didn't kill them made them stronger. I remember uh, my younger... My, I mean, my older one, when he was first born, we were in, like, a small basement in the East Village working at a small basement, and I had him in a box. But, you know, I mean, was, he was safe and everything, but he was in one of our boxes because I didn't want, you know, to crawl around. I mean, you have to do what you've got to do. And, you know, he was safe, it was clean, but it was a, it was a box. You mentioned <laughs> all your traveling. Um, what is it like having an internationally recognized business and what's been like the biggest challenge that comes along with that? It's great. It was our dream to be an international company. Right. We had um, an advisor who was saying, no, don't go into international, stick with domestic, stick with what you know. And we said, no, we, no. we want to be international. We want right. our brand to be worldwide and galaxy-wide. That's right. And <laughs> we, we, when we were children, we, were, we always gravitated to anyone who was from a foreign land because we just found it so interesting. We had Japanese friends, Peruvian friends, Korean friends. And really, really friends and like people from all over the world. Just so fascinating. I always wanted to have friends all over the world, right. and now we do. How do you manage keeping your product quality and brand recognition high across countries? We test every batch. We're total control freaks. We micromanage. We adhere to all those global compliance, and it's like so much work. It really is, especially since I think we're one of the only brands that has our product in a clear container, so you can actually see the color. Mm -hmm. oh, wow. And that it's a lot harder to keep your quality control when, when that's a factor. If it's, a, if it's an opaque bottle, people all fill it up close enough to rock and roll, but that's not the way we operate. Brookside Chocolates has a commercial that features both of you guys um, when promoting their chocolate. How did this partnership come about? They just contacted us. <laughs> and, ooh, they contacted us and they said, what? Chocolate? Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Oh, and they were so yeah. nice, and it was such a cool campaign. It really it was. Featuring all different healthy women, because they had these little chocolate balls. Did you guys see an <laughs> impact of, on your sales from that? It's really hard to say. I'm, I'm sure. I'm it's sure it did. <laughs> yeah. Right. People wouldn't necessarily know our brand before. I'm sure. That's true. I'm, I'm sure it has. And I hope it helps them, because they were very nice. Um, what advice do you have for high school and college women who want to start a business? Don't give up. Don't give up. Don't give up. Never take no for an answer. If it's your passion, got to follow it. It's got to be your passion if you want to make it your business mm -hmm. because it's gonna, you're going to be married to it. It's going to be with you morning, noon, and night, 24-7. We have panic mares all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Good manic, panic, pleasant dreams, but uh, most of the time it's, you know, stress. It's like, oh, my God, I dreamed we didn't do something that we're supposed to do or... <laughs> But, you know, you have to have that dedication. You have to understand you're getting into your own business, that there's no such thing as nine to five. No right. such thing. Yeah, you can just go home and forget about it after it's with you. And you have to make sure that you have, um, you know, if you have a partner, that that partner understands that, you know, your business is, like, a really big part of your life. Specifically, you know, for young girls who have started their own cosmetic business. Um, focusing on anywhere between lipsticks, eyeshadows, mascara, nail polish. What advice would you give them specifically since you guys are um, leading the cosmetics industry? I would say don't do what everybody else is doing. You know, you have to make it your own or nobody's going to want it. Yeah, you have to figure out your little niche and, and what differentiates you and your product from everything else that's out there. It should be special. You have to... Stay totally on top of quality for every product that you do. Test every batch. Do you still have your own retail stores? We have our online store. We don't have any brick and mortar stores anymore. We're talking about we're talking with some people about um, opening up some salons. Mm -hmm. Yeah, salons. And we would license our name for um, boutiques as well because we just got a new uh, licensing. Um, so as we're wrapping up our interview, um, we are. Can our viewers go ahead and purchase your product? Manic Panic Dot. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, thank you guys.
guys so much for taking the time to sit down and talk through your business model with us. Um, I think that our viewers are going to get a lot of beneficial um, information from you and a lot of inspiration about how you guys have overcome so much to be as successful as you are. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. And be sure to tell them to keep on being fearlessly fabulous. You have to be fearless if you're going to start your own And live fast and dye your hair. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.